Martin, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution, Rosanna and Anita and Michael. Good Happy morning, Friday. Revolution. That's Good morning, morning Revolution. So everybody's doing okay. I hope so. Uh, it's been an interesting week. It's always an interesting week. That's because the class struggle is continuing. And in some respects, it is, I hear, increasing. There's a strike wave going on all over the country. Rosanna, I didn't, you know, I uh, gave a report to the national board two weeks ago and I said, guys, sisters, there's a crisis of inaction. I was worried about what was happening. I still am at the national level with respect to all of the bills that are taking place around the country on infrastructure, on the uh, human infrastructure, the 3.5 trillion and the machinations of mansion and seminar. But I took my eye off of the working class, Rosanna. I didn't know that the uh, Yatsi workers in, in California had authorized a strike vote, Kellogg strikes. Um, <clears throat> was my John vision heard? Yeah, John Deere also. Well, John I don't. Deere. I don't know if your vision was blurred. You got your glasses on today, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think you know. I, I, <clears throat> I don't think people have stopped. It doesn't seem like it. But, I mean, I actually had ninety-eight uh, percent. I think something to that effect of voters, and out of that, ninety percent voted to strike. That's huge. And they're getting ready. They've set a date. I don't remember exactly what date, but uh, we're starting to make posters here to get ready to support them. And um, I think it's going to be the really key. We'll see if they even go on strike. It's a lot of businesses that are going to be affected, not just by the, you know the strike. I mean, not just the, the workers, but all these other other things that are going on. So it's it's a big risk if they don't settle. 109 strikes, Anita, mm. this year alone. Wow. It's, yeah, even in, even here in Columbus, we have small strikes and, and, and larger union actions going on. We, my club participated in a couple of actions this uh, month for the Worthington libraries, just library workers who know that the, uh, the budget is such that they could, they should get um, a fair wage and they're not doing it and also um, Zanesville teachers, nurses out in the Kaiser hospital systems too, I understand are on, on strike or are threatening to strike. So I think it's a really, there's a, a time of real demand on the part of working people coming back out of this pandemic economy that they want fair wages and good working conditions. Yeah, they talk about essential, 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 but they need some, uh, we need some essential money. We wanna welcome John Cage to the program this morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Revolution. Glad you're... We're talking about the strike wave that's taking place all over the country, John. I said there was a crisis in an action two weeks ago. Rosanna says my vision was blurred, even though I got my glasses on. What, what did I miss, John? Unmute yourself, John. You're still muted. Okay. Uh, well, in West Virginia, I think there was uh, three strikes going on when you were making your remarks, and uh, now there's a fourth. Um, so, uh, yeah, you probably uh, – it, um, it's, it's been coming for a while. I mean, the, frust uh, the frustration in the uh, – all three of the – three at least three of the strikes in West Virginia are directly related to just stress from working through the pandemic – and uh, being asked to work longer hours to make concessions in labor agreements and other, you know, aspects uh, to, you know, be heroes for the country in a way. And uh, then they get to this point and the company's making a lot of money, you know, there's a shortage of labor uh, coming back into the labor market anyway. And... Um, the people feel like they have some power, but the frustration that's been pent up. Uh, and then a company comes to them and says, no, we want more concessions. Um, and you can see that uh, when they have a chance to have an outlet, boy, they, uh, they're speaking their minds with their feet. <clears throat> it's 
picking their minds with their feet and 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 voting with their feet. Michael, uh, the AFL-CIO is calling it Striketober. Striketober. And, That's uh, a good name. It's a catchy name with a hashtag and everything. Hashtag Striketober. And uh, so there's growing uh, labor activism. I just wonder, though, um, how much of it is related to the so-called tight job market and um, more that it's just people are just fed up, you know, and that, <clears throat> that <clears throat> feeling of being mistreated and, and uh, dogged and not taken seriously and exploited and this, uh, you know, ask for concession after concession after concession is just built up and people said, you know, you know, blank this, I'm not taking it. What is it? I'm fired up and not taking it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a combination of factors. Um, Anita mentioned the Kaiser workers, which I understand are, are, are nurses. Um, and their big thing is uh, safe staffing. And, you know, a lot of these workers, you know, on top of, you know, unfair and, and, and unjust and unsafe working conditions, they have families. They have young children who are going to school uh, with, with teachers who are um, upset, you know, about, the, about the, the masks and so forth. And so I think people are frustrated all around. I understand also in some states and some cities, um, the rent moratorium is coming to an end. Unemployment is coming to an end. Uh, these bills aren't being passed through Congress. You know, the filibuster is still in effect. And so people are frustrated all around. And so they're seeing this as, you know, it's been a year and a half of this pandemic. And so now's the time to really rise up. It's really refreshing to see, actually. Well, there's another piece of this as well. What did you say, Scott? Uh, Welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I uh, got in a little late. But um, so, uh, yeah, I saw uh, an article, I think it was yesterday. I forget which newspaper or platform it was on, but the title of it was, why are so many workers going on strike? So can you not read the placards? Can you not hear the, like, I, I don't know what more analysis you need than, you know, people are fed up and people are, you know, um, being overworked. Uh, jobs are, despite the constant talk, as you say, Joe, about, you know, um, you know, so many jobs, no, can't hire anybody, et cetera. Jobs are actually hard to get. You know, I'm hearing more and more stories of people that are interviewing for, you know, multiple jobs. So conditions are hard. Um, the other side of it is that people are organized. It's, it's not just that, you know, there's, I think there's this thought that some people sometimes get that if it gets bad enough, people rise up, right? But there's an intermediate step there. There's been a lot of organizing, um, intense organizing going on um, for quite a few years now, both within the labor movement and you know, more broadly in social movements in the electoral field. And that organization is also contributing to, uh, I think to this, uh, to this strike wave, to the willingness and What happened to Scott or is it me? It's no, Scott. Oh, okay. Scott, we lost you for a second. You're gonna come back strong. And when you do, you can speak. But you know, the strike actions are taking place on different levels. It's a slowdown to postal workers. You know, in Minneapolis, bus drivers are on strike, mechanics, and so on and so forth. Are you back, Scott? Can you hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. we can hear you now, but you're frozen. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, go on. I'm going to mute myself and figure out my situation. <laughs> All right. Now, in the midst of all of this, and by the way, Cornell University has a strike monitor. You know, their labor department set that up on May Day of this year, and they're tracking all of the job actions. And so if you want to check it out, go to their website and, uh, and uh, log on to it. But in the meantime, there are ongoing efforts to organize Amazon, John Case, and I understand that the Communist Party's Labor Commission is having a webinar tomorrow. And we wanna, we've been in the fray, but we wanna move the entire party organization, people's world, allies and friends into, and to join the United Campaign around organizing Amazon. You wanna tell us a little bit about it? 
Oh, sure, I could uh, go on for a couple of days about it, but... Uh, well, you have to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of different angles on it. I mean, one is there are active campaigns of different kinds already underway in Amazon and some Amazon facilities. Uh, there's al already been a couple of elections uh, one, I think, on Staten Island, I believe, a while ago. Or, actually, I don't think they had the election. I think the Teamsters with, with, withdrew from it before the election because Amazon engaged in their a very interesting tactic that they can do that is a feature of their um, mass employment model, at least in the um, distribution system. And that is they have a very volatile headcount. Uh, when the primed week comes through, right, you know, or uh, the big holidays, right, where there's going to be a, a lot of shipping on one or two day notices, they will bring in and Bessemer, they said it was because of demand, but we think it was because of the union, they brought in an extra thousand employees in the little window between the time the union files and the size of the bargaining unit is determined right and set so that uh, the head the actual count in the vote was a thousand bigger than the workers and the union had calculated maybe more i mean maybe part of the error was the unions but but regardless you get the basic idea anyway uh the political economy of um so there's actions going on the stress of the if, if you haven't watched the nomad land the movie or the series uh, you know, it is a mag the introduction, the first half hour is just a magnificent introduction to the mobile com workforce component at Amazon. Um, an aerial photo, for example, of the uh, Raleigh plant in uh, North Carolina, <clears throat> where we have a comrade and a group of people working, actually, um, you know, shows that there's a campground with 300 trailers okay within a mile and a half of the fulfillment center and those folks are working seasonally at amazon and then we'll move on some of them you know like the company in curry well we have a we're going to have a big backlog in ohio why don't you move that and there's a campground there you know so you know 300 families and workers are so you see the the big chain it's a unique feature of this workforce maybe um, the political economy is, is there's actually though that there's uh, that Amazon is now a national security asset. Um, without the pandemic, uh, if it had failed, we'd have to uh, bail it out and hold it up. You're trying to if it wasn't an Amazon, we'd have to invent one. Yes, and we would. What does that say about this campaign that you're trying to discuss it tomorrow? It means that the solution to Amazon, because it's so big, keep in mind there's 318 fulfillment centers, uh, it's just in the United States. And um, so the, the, the campaign to organize Amazon is also a campaign to partially at least socialize Am Amazon and similar firms. And the reason is that when you have a too big to fail firm, and its size is so vast um, that, you know, it, 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 it has more power than, you know, uh, that, that, that can be let loose on its own upon the world. Now, it, the, uh, and I think there's many aspects. That, keep in mind the stakeholders in Amazon include um, the largest number of businesses that do uh, computing in the cloud, and by the way, that would be everybody using AI, all right? Uh, Amazon Web Services is the largest uh, cloud service in the world. You have many millions of small businesses that use it and its distribution system as a way to be in business right now, and without that infrastructure, uh, most would not be able to do what they're doing. So you have a, and, and the workforce of Amazon reflects and mirrors the composition of the American workforce. Um, and so the, ch and the challenges of organizing it are the challenges of uniting those workers, 
both in their uh, trade union or employee life, but also in their political and community life because the immense impact the corporation has on their communities wherever they locate. And given that, what are you asking the party to do? Well, I think we're uh, trying to establish a national concentration in which centered around the uh, a news service and establishing um, uh, committees, rank, uh, committees to both get into the plan and to form collectives around people that are in the plan to basically start linking the stories of that workforce together via either directly or indirectly the people's world. And we had a great discussion with the People's World, I think, last week, uh, and the staff, about uh, ways in which we might do that. Uh, workers' correspondence pages, um, a uh, can or a whole a feature, you know, uh, devoted to the campaign of, organiz of organizing Amazon and raising a, developing a program and communication links between them. I promise you that if uh, if if a coordinated Initial, initialized campaign of raising a question based on knowing something about about the, the, the fulfillment center plans. If it if, if you leafleted it and got action and a minimum amount of response, like the response they're getting in Raleigh, at three different coordinated sites in uh, the country, the company will react. They will react, and that's great because now you got a conversation going. And uh, that's what the, everybody in the everybody in these shops. I mean, they love the the, the conversation it, 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 when it's about them and people they know. They're into it. I will say one thing about the on the question of the labor shortage issue. By the way, I, it it does make a difference when people sense their power or lack of it. You know, and the and the market the the, the fact that you have strikes taking place right now. I mean, yeah, the, and the pent up frustration is the main motive. But don't undercount the fact that yes, they the company's having a hard time meeting demand, and so they have they sense they have some power in the in the bargaining equation. And everybody in the shop is always sensitive. I never saw a strike vote in my life that didn't have you know, a b whole bunch of people saying, okay, what's really winnable here? You know, what can be lost? You know, what's the real relationship of forces? So, yeah. And that's why they got to cut unemployment, Scott, because too many of the working class are living high on the hog, driving around Cadillacs and, uh, you know, eating caviar. Yeah, these lazy, entitled workers who, you know, think they deserve just what, a place to live, like food. You just, you just deserve to have these things. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, these, these transparent, uh, mostly Republican-led efforts to force people back into the job market, not figure out, you know, what would incentivize people to go back, not figure out, you know, Maybe we need to provide childcare. Maybe we need to whatever, but to just um, put people in the most desperate and most precarious uh, position possible. It's the use of, of you know, it, maybe more clearly than anything else I've seen, the use of political power to directly, you know, force people under the thumb of, of employers and, and, and corporations. It's completely ridiculous. Well, and uh, that's why, you know, organizations like the Poor People's Campaign are coordinating activities all over the country, Rob Rosanna. Um, what are they doing in California? Well, we've met with the, um, with Senator Padilla, uh, representative, to talk about um, that as well as uh, other issues. Uh, we've been holding, uh, mostly educational types of things to educate our membership. But, you know, once again, it's always about the poor people and, and bringing them up. And it's always a fight. Uh, we've been pushing for the Build Back Better um, bill to be passed, um, presented, I think it was 100,000 signatures in October. Uh, last, this last Monday, was presented and um, still pushing the legislatures. Very important, very important. I understand that the Poor People's Campaign is going to organize a national demonstration, I believe in June. 
in Washington. Every, year, every June we have one, yes. Every June, and uh, mm -hmm. to culminate this, uh, and it'll be here before you know it. I can smell turkey already. Mm. <laughs> and, 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 and prior to that smell, I smell ghosts because Halloween is, I see dead people, smell dead people. Oops, I don't want to smell no dead people, I'm sorry. And, 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 and so the, before you know it, June will be here. Um, and, uh, but right now the struggle, uh, Michael, is in the Senate um, against Semina and John's favorite Senator, uh, Mr. Manchin to get them to uh, pass the PRO Act, pass that 3.4, well, it's not gonna be 3.5 anymore. It might be somewhere Lower. $2 trillion. Yeah, that's a, the that's low, you know, on the ground. It's unfortunate. it's unfortunate, but the, you know, the people's movements, specifically the Sunrise Movement, it, um, advertised some interesting campaigns this week, uh, trying to convince uh, cinema and mansion um, to really, you know, represent the people instead of, you know, these oil companies and so forth. And they were calling it the hold the line, hold the line in Congress campaign. And I thought it was really cute since uh, Kristen Cinema identifies as bisexual. They had a phone bank called Hot Bisexuals Against Cinema, where they were calling her and saying, hey, you know, you're out of line and kind of like that confrontation in the bathroom and everything. But there's lots of interesting uh, campaigns to, to get these senators to really represent their constituents. I mean, John Case would probably know better than I since he lives in West Virginia, but there's a most West Virginians need the, the Build Back Better plan to be passed. Uh, it, we're all going to benefit from it. And so it's just ridiculous that, you know, these quote unquote Democrats that played uh, overall, we could say a positive role in the fight against the extreme right now do not let this progress get passed through Congress. And it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, on the issue of LBGD, G, LGBTQ rights, there are good news and bad news. Um, on the bad news tip, uh, the Netflix has a uh, uh, program with uh, my home guy from Ohio, the comedian Dave Chappelle, that's been sharply criticized for its homophobic, transphobic uh, content. And I started to watch it, but I, I couldn't watch the whole thing. It was like, you know, and so that's the bad news. Um, on the good news front, though, there's a new uh, bisexual character, Superman's son, has come out the closet, Anita. And, you know, now you, we have a popular cultural uh, figure in, in that mm -hmm. imaginary world that is uh, standing up for his, her, and their personhood rights. Right, it's great, it's great news. I, I didn't learn it firsthand, but um, but I think uh, com the comics world is sometimes on the forefront of those kind of, of those kind of uh, things. So um, that this has happened before, I'm uh, really interested to, to hear what's going on. I don't know whether, has there been a lot of a uh, reaction? There usually is when, uh, when, you know, one's, uh, you know, sacred, idols are, are uh, interfered with in that way or made uh, made to to be uh, something transgressive. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I, I'm not on top of this story, so I don't know what, what the blowback has been, but I think it's great news. Fox, you, New Fox News. news. I said Fox News responded. They said that the left is sexualizing uh, superheroes. And I thought, well, but was it sexualizing superheroes when Superman and uh, Lois, you know, where they're kissing and stuff and all the comic, you know, no, it's, it's all the sudden sexual when um, someone isn't, you know, um, heterosexual, cisgender. And so, but I think overall the representation is positive. We had this conversation a few years ago with the Black Panther when that movie came out and, you know, all these young African-American um, boys, girls, and everywhere in between, you know, could say, oh, I identify as that, you know, I can be a superhero too. And so that's important. Representation is always important. Love who you love, no matter what your sexual orientation or gender is. I mean, give me a break. Um, you know? Positive development, yes. Yeah, I think it's important to point out that 
I think it's also important to point out or to take note of the fact that um, things do change. We see, we're seeing these changes that we're not even um, maybe aware of in a way, but there's a lot of you know, times people say, oh, things don't change, but they are changing. Um, you know, even on the, the commercials, you see mixed race couples you see, you, you know, you, you see, uh, uh, you see other things that really show you that things are changing. And though, you know, and in uh, fashion shows, there's no longer thin, little thin women. You know, there's all different size women in the fashion, uh, fashion world, not that I follow it, but uh, you know, you, I mean, you, you can just see, but these are subtle changes that tell you things do change. So that folks who think nothing changes, they do change. It just takes time and it's a process of that. That's it. And I think that's an important part. The mold of history is continuing to burrow. <laughs> and the class and democratic struggle takes place whether you see it or not. And then it explodes. We're gonna have to wrap up, unfortunately. It's 11 o'clock and uh, but we want to thank John for coming and telling us about the Amazon campaign. We're going to be discussing it at the Labor Department's uh, webinar uh, tomorrow. We're going to be hearing about it more next week, the results here on Facebook and on YouTube. And we're going to be including it in our analysis at the National Committee meeting on October 31st, uh, where we will hear the comrades stand up and criticize me for not recognizing that strike wave two weeks ago and discussing a crisis of inaction because I took my eye off of the working class, Scott, and that's the thing you should never, <laughs> never ever do. Well, uh, that does it for this week. Thanks for uh, tuning in. We'll see you next week. And until then, stay strong, stay safe, and stay in the fight. Good morning, Revolution, y'all. Have a great week. Morning, morning Revolution. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.